I'm Christopher Joseph. I work for the web platform team at Adobe. And I work on open source frameworks, uh, JavaScript and CSS, Topco being the first. And I'm Guillermo Torres. I'm a design manager for Adobe. And I, I support the web authoring team. So we create tools for modern web design and web development. All right, so what is Topcode? Topcode is a CSS library for clean and fast applications. Uh, that's it. It's just CSS. We are live. We're, um, we're on GitHub. We're open source. And the reason why we're here is because we wanted to get in with the community early. We wanted to get to your input. We want you guys to collaborate with us in, into creating this, this library. Um, we have seen a need for this type of library bec mainly because we've, a lot of the, the frameworks that we've been using are mainly designed towards websites, responsive sites, and, more, and web apps. And one of the things that, that we were seeing the need is that we needed something for installed applications. Wow. Um, so our, our need is started uh, mainly internal from, for edge tools and services. So these tools and services are, are, um, are the new way that, that we're trying to create um, tools for and products for web designers and web developers. So instead of the normal Adobe way of creating uh, uh, products in which that there's some, this monolithic feature rich tool, we're focusing on creating these tools that are very lightweight, that are task oriented. So we have tools like uh, Reflow, which is a tool that is mainly for, for responsive design. Then we have Brackets, which is an open source tool. It's a lightweight code editor that we, in which we also have co edge code that is similar. And then we have Edge Inspect that is a, um, a, a tool for, for um, previewing on your mobile devices. And this lives either on a browser or integrated with our, our own tools. So the underlying thing for, for this is that all of these tools are created using web standards. So for that, we needed to create a new language because we, we really didn't really uh, have a design language based out of that. We were mainly used to creating tools on the desktop, those feature-rich tools. So one of the things that, that we set out that we needed to make is a design language that was based on web standards. And it was meant not just for the desktop, but to live, say, in browsers and mobile and in a, a lot of places. Additionally, uh, we support the PhoneGap community. It's, it's a community that creates installed mobile apps. Um, and one of the things that, that we're seeing with the PhoneGap community is that they were, uh, there were a lot of um, developers that were just getting started, so didn't have access to design resources. Uh, and on the other side, we had, they had, there were developer, uh, devel developers that did have the design resources, but eventually they felt that they needed to migrate away from web standards technology to native. Uh, mainly because of the, there was this uh, perceived notion that, that it would be more performant. So that sort of was another goal for us, is to create uh, a library that was, that was very fast, that was performant. And then out of all of this, what we saw is that the common denominator was CSS. One of the things that we we're seeing with all the different apps and all, everything that we we're doing is that everyone had the, the framework of choice. Even uh, at Adobe, our, because we're following a, a, an Agile model, every, t every product team had, had to find their own uh, framework. And it was hard to, for, for, for the design team to come out to the product team as like saying, hey, you need to replace this framework or you need to, 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 to change this in order to, for us to, to keep a consist, cons, consistent uh, uh, look and feel. So when we got started, we started uh, getting the design foundation and inv we invited stakeholders from the product management team and engineering team to get a visual direction on it. And we did some uh, research over what this design language would be looking like. And uh, at Adobe, our main principle is always that content is king. We design tools for content creators, which means that it's, the, the, it's not the UI that should be highlighted. It should be the content that's being created. But for edge tools and services and for this, the, the products that Topcode is, is supporting, uh, there was a little twist because we're not just for desktop. It was mainly for these applications that could live anywhere. So we started looking about what the design language is for, for desktop apps. For desktop apps, you want something that is more solid. You want something that, that, that feels like you want to grab it, like you want to pay for it. It's, it's a little bit more, uh, the, the, more solid. The content is, 
usually fixed or contained, and the UI usually takes most of the, the, the space, and the UI is usually fixed, it looks fixed. And in contrast, uh, we have web apps. Web apps, the, the content is more dynamic, even the UI is more dynamic. You don't, re you don't really see it fixed as much. It seems to be changing uh, quite fast. So that was the, lang the design language. And this is different than websites, when websites were looking at, say, like very targeted type of interaction, so like buy now or download, or like for, but for applications, you still have to design for very complex workflows. Um, so for, for brackets, for instance, we still wanted to, to, to have the content framed in something that, it, that looked solid, but because it was still something that, that was based on web standards, we didn't really want to fix the UI as much to the actual frame. Um, additionally, we, we were looking at what, what were the considerations around mobile, and for us, typography was, ended up being the most important change. Um, because you have so little space to actually show UI, you need to rely on hierarchy and typography to, to, to really um, bring the content to light. Um, additionally, we were, were uh, exploring theming. One of the things that we saw is that when you go to mobile, you have more opportunities to bring your brand into the UI. So one of the things that would be important for, for, for top code is for, for us to, be, to, to make it easily be themable. Um, and CSS is, is, is great for this, but in, in, an, in any way, we wanted to create a good system so it's not just about changing a bunch of numbers. Um, the other part when it comes to uh, designing for native apps is that you always have to choose what's the context that you're, that you're developing in. And, uh, when it comes to mobile in particular, you're always questioning, okay, if I'm going to be designing for iOS app, then am, am I replay, uh, replicating the UI from iOS? Or if I'm designing for Android, what am I replicating? So there's, one of the things that, that we found is that it, it, w it wasn't really even a, a wild goose chase. It, there was no there there when it, when it came to replicating a specific language. Um, so what our goal was for Topco is to be a good OS citizen. What this meant for us is that we're designing for lightweight, small apps. And those apps were meant to be working all together with a set of apps that were from the US or third party or whatever. And what we wanted to, to keep is a, is a, a non-jarring user experience. So as you switch from different apps, you're not having to relearn a specific language. We wanted to find a common thread across all OS uh, parts. So we started looking at what were the trends that the big players in the industry were taking. And a big one was Microsoft. I was very excited about um, Metro UI, now known as a uh, modern UI. Um, I was really excited about the flat look and feel and the, the use of typography. And, and in the same way on the web design uh, track, you would see all this talk about flat UI. And one of the things that, that I started finding out with, uh, particularly with Microsoft, is that once you got deeper and deeper into the experience, once you got into more of the professional tools, that's when the experience started to sort of fall apart. It wasn't like really as, as useful. And the, 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 and the thing is that, it's, is that for flat UI and this type of language, there needs to be a lot of design considerations because you're left with saying more with less. Um, so there needs to be a, uh, uh, some really good designers on it. And the other part is that the language is still pretty new, so it hasn't really evolved. It hasn't really, the metaphors hasn't really been set. A big culprit of this was actually this screen. I, st I stared at the screen a long time, uh, was um, looking for, for um, a clue for, for North Star. And the main thing is this, this weird looking toggle. Oops, sorry. That weird looking toggle that is like, why, the, why do you have to design that Oh, we toggle, and the thing is that if that, that's definitely designed by an empirical designer because you actually don't need a toggle button. If you were really going flat, you wouldn't, re you wouldn't have a toggle button. You use the whole card for, for uh, toggling on and off. Um, so my thought was that this is actually a very important uh, um, example for, North, for, um, for top code, mainly because we were designing not for designers, we were designing for developers. And we needed to empower designers to make good design decisions. And if we, if we corner them into a flat UI part where they needed to think more holistically over like what's the overall interaction, then you would see a lot more fumbling like this. Um, so in terms of going flat UI, we still sort of wanted to follow a little bit of the design language. The, the, we, we designed a, an icon set that was 
uh, still flat. We're, um, we're pretty excited about um, icon fonts, the semantic icon fonts. So we still wanted to follow that. And Adobe also created its, uh, its first uh, open source font, um, the Source Sans. And one of the things that was very important for us is that it's still it's very clear. Um, you, you can tell the one from the, from the capital I and from the L from the I. So it's still following that sense of clearness. Um, additionally, there's what Apple was doing, uh, and I'm, I'm actually uh, very tired of, of, of the, uh, all the conversation around humorism. I think that it's been the culprit of a lot, a lot of talks, but what I really wanted about, uh, to, to bring from Apple's humorism is the sense of humanity, like the, the, the notion that there's buttons that want to be pushed. I wanted to move away from this realism, but we still wanted to convey some humanity. It was still something that was made by humans. And finally, one of the things that was very important for uh, top code is that we wanted to accelerate design, but in dev terms. For us, the CSS is, is very exciting. And actually being here is, is great because it's, CSS has become this sort of dialogue between designers and developers, where there's on the, on the one hand, you get designers that even designers that, that know how to work on CSS and do a lot of CSS, then they provide the CSS, but they're still shy, too shy to really do pull requests and get into the code because they're afraid of breaking stuff. And on the other hand, you have developers that see CSS more of a, sort of like a, a declarative and, and, and just adding here and there, and which makes it for, for sloppy writing. Um, so so one, what we really wanted to, uh, to do is sort of empower developers to create the best with a design, with a, with a good design base so they can add on top of that when, once they have a designer. Um, so we, what we ended up doing was uh, this, uh, a style kit, and the style kit is it's all done in CSS, but it was all uh, designed in CSS, but it's just suggestive CSS at this point. Um, what we ended up doing was just CSS that some developers might be able to, to co copy and paste, but then that's when we um, were able to get Christopher. And Christopher will talk to you about the architecture of Topcode. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, right, so we had these style guides. They were HTML and CSS, but we mainly used them when I worked on Reflow to pull colors and some styles from, and then we'd write our own CSS um, from that style guide. We wanted to start using it more of a component, actually make components out of it, because what I was seeing in the code base is that someone would actually use a button and they go, oh, I like that button, and they copy and paste it somewhere else, and they would change, and they copy and paste that somewhere else, and it would change, and they'd all have you know, like set variations of their, of their name, their class name, and it became really hard to maintain. So started thinking about what it would take to make a component architecture out of CSS, and it came down to mainly just using the tools that we used every day, top coats architecture, uh, is around three things. GitHub, so it uses GitHub a lot for GitHub repos. It uses Stylus, which is uh, you know the preprocessor that we use. It could have used any preprocessor, and actually I hope to use Rework in the future. But it worked really well with our other la our last tool, which is Grunt. Um, so the Grunt is just a build script that puts it all together and gets you the end result, which is just CSS. And that's what I think is so cool about. Topcoat and why I was so excited to work on it is because it is just CSS at the end of the day. To use Topcoat, it's just as easy as taking a style sheet and linking it to your HTML page, and that's it. Um, then you have to put in your classes and whatnot, but it's no more steps than that. It also allows you to work with any, like Guillermo said, any framework of choice. We're not making any presumptions about how you should write your JavaScript or how you should write your markup. You can use it piecemeal. You can use any part that you want. So when we were working on the Edge web tools and services, it, it came really apparent that people don't care if it's native or not as long as it performs correctly. The only time that they notice that it's not native is when it doesn't work right. When like Reflow is all written in HTML and JavaScript and CSS, and it's plenty fast. It works exactly how you'd expect, right? So no one actually goes in and says, oh, well, you know, you should make that native, or it's not native. They don't, it doesn't come up because it performs correctly. Which brings us to our first focus for Topcoat was performance. Started thinking about, well, if performance and native feel is the most important thing for our framework or our library, how would you do that? How do you actually 
get performance metrics from CSS. And you can do a lot of stuff locally. You know, you can open up your dev tools, and you can poke around, you can do audits, and that's great, but how do you share that with other people? And how do you actually do that over time? How do you share those results with people? And how do you actually see if your optimizations are still working? In um, current, you know, green browsers, that could change nightly. You could have an optimization change that actually doesn't work the next day and actually could impact performance the next day. And you wouldn't know unless you had something that showed you over time. So when we talk about performance, it's, it comes down to just don't take my word for it. Don't take anybody's word for it. You should actually be running tests all the time. And we have a solution for this, which is bench.topcoat.io. It's a part of our continuous integration. We actually run a Chrome telemetry tests against our CSS, and basically what it does is runs a Chromeless, or Chromeless, headless Chrome browser and does a scrolling test and then takes the results and posts it to our server so we can graph it. Um, and here it is live. And again, this is all really early stuff, so we only have a few builds up, but we wanted to show you where we're headed and so we could get people to give feedback. It gives you some metrics off the bat, but then it gives you this baseline metrics. We have a baseline test that we run our styled, a baseline component that's not styled that we run our styled component tests against. And you can see it's getting a little bit faster as we go along, as we learn more. Um, and remember, we're taking CSS that hasn't been optimized at all. We're just taking it straight from a style guide and putting it in and then running against baselines and trying to incrementally change it and make it faster so that it's deterministic. So we can actually point at something and be like, that was faster. Not just saying, I don't know, something changed and it was better. Uh, the other one is, you can actually go in and it tells you the mean frame layout and loads. And then if I had another commit in here, I could actually compare two commits and you could actually go to a shop. If you saw a spike in performance, I could actually go to GitHub and see what changes I actually made and go, oh, okay, well that sped it up or that really slowed it down. I can make it, I can revert that. Consideration for, a main consideration for Topka was also versioning. The, our first foray into using a CSS framework was pretty painful. We uh, put in a framework and then we wanted to get just a modal dialog because it got updated. And we had to update the entire framework and actually broke a lot of things that we were using. So I started thinking a lot about, well, what would it take to be able to fix that? Like, what, what would I need to be able to make that work better? And so this is the configuration file. I'm showing like the dirty back part. Hmm? the underlyings of how we actually build this. So the, in this package JSON, these are just GitHub repos, and this is a tag. So I'm creating a tag version of the repo. If you wanted to update, if we updated button, for instance, you could actually just update button, or if you we updated everything, you could, just, you could just update the ones that you wanted. So if you were happy with button, if you didn't want to change it, you didn't have to, you could go back to any version. This also supports nightlies, if you wanted to just use the nightly or see what we're doing at the bleeding edge of Topcoat, you could remove the version altogether and it'll actually just do a get shallow clone and pull it down for you locally so you can see where we're headed. We also wanted to allow for subsetting. And this could be um, something as grand as subsetting icons or subsetting fonts or, but what we're focusing on right, right now is subsetting components. You probably don't want a huge style sheet. As Topcoat grows, we're going to have a bunch of components and a bunch of patterns. You probably don't want all of them in your, in your application. You might only need a few. And you might actually have replacements for a couple of the components of your own. So you can specify just the ones that you want. So I could say, oh, I just want search input. And you could rerun the build and just get that in your final CSS output. And then for those of you who don't want to be mucking around and configuration files, we're building this, you know, a la Bootstrap, customized, download your own build uh, website where you can select a theme, choose the components that you want, and all that's going to do behind the scenes is edit that config file. So if you wanted to do it by hand, you could do that. And then platform support. Especially for mobile, we realize that you're trying to get as fast as you possibly can in as lean of a CSS as you need, and also you probably don't want to have Mozilla prefixes or IE prefixes on your Safari WebKit browser for iOS. So what we're building in is the ability to specify the platforms that you're targeting and even go farther and specify the versions. So for instance, you know, the largest used versions of Android, you could support both of them. And then you could even add specific hats, hacks for 
those specific versions of that platform. I started realizing that, like I said, people were using, trying to make component-oriented CSS in our code bases, but they were failing because they were just copying and pasting and there was no common subset. Uh, they were using a, a lot of different techniques to do this, but the one I saw most commonly was naming convention. And I can't take credit for the one that we're using for top code. This is actually based off of Nicholas Gallagher's early work um, for suit. But you can see what it's doing. It's namespacing, so you can find it easy. And you can actually create a theme that has your own namespace. Um, it specifies the component that you're in, and then it breaks it down into different parts of the component. And also you can have, so if you look at the icon button, you can have a modification of that, a different type of icon button, a quiet one, for instance. Uh, we're also separating concerns. So this is, top coat is mainly concerned about styling, but we're also adding in uh, layout and transitions and whatnot. Those are going to be separate classes that we'll supply. That way you could uh, sub in your own grid system if you wanted to, for instance, and we'll have something to get you going, but if you wanted to use some cohesive grid system, you could just slap that in, use a piecemeal. Uh, this is another part where we got some feedback that this is too verbose. I totally, I totally hear that. And it would be a really awesome to hear what the community thinks and get feedback on that kind of stuff. Like, how would you do it? How would you like it to be? I'd love to hear that from people. Um, we focused a lot on resets, and this is also uh, from Nicholas Gallagher's findings. But I think we took it a step farther because we're using these reset components. So this, for instance, this button is just a, a tag, but it doesn't have the blue. It's not underlined, right? We reset it to look to be a base for a button. Um, and we're using this for our our baseline test. So we put 200 of those on a page, scroll it, see how fast that is, put 200 of our styled version on the page, scroll that and see how fast that is, and we compare them. That way we figure the fastest you can get is this reset button. It's actually not going to get any faster than that. So we're hoping we can, over time, get as close to the reset as we can. That's our testing ideas. We considered themes from the very beginning. It needed to be themable. We wanted to be able to, as uh, Guillermo said, in the early days when we were working on applications like Photoshop, uh, it was really hard to theme them. The, the designers would have to go in and beg someone to make a change for them, or they'd have to like, go in and learn how to hack C code, and they didn't really want to do that. Now we have this really amazing workflow where the designer can go in and be like, it looks, this should look something like that. And then a, des and a developer goes through and re-edits it. But now we're going to try and get to the point where you can actually expose the variables that you want to edit, and the designer can actually theme, make a theme version of the theme. So in here, it's another, yet another GitHub repo. It's top coat theme. And this is just a collection of variables and mix-ins that you can use to make your own theme. You could actually just go through and change the variables if you wanted to and get something that looks drastically different. Or if you wanted to, you could make a whole other version and, and sub that in. You can make a whole other repo and sub that in for your own theme. The, the default top coat theme is an example theme um, that I built out that has two variations, dark and light, so that you could actually show how it works, how we could actually achieve a dark and a light theme with one set of, um, one set of style files. And if you want to look at the insides of that, so it uses uh, convention over configuration. I'm Making some, taking some liberties here and being like, well, if you name it theme dash, can you see that? Yeah, okay. If you name it theme dash, you probably want to generate, this is your theme file, and you want to generate that into a final CSS. So this just imports variables, right? So I have dark variables. It has exactly what you'd expect, the dark colors and the dark icons. And as a light variables, right? And then mobile is just sizing for mobile. And you can imagine um, if I had a desktop variables desktop, it would just be the sizes for desktop. We see those two converging, but slowly. So I figure this will set us up to succeed in that area when desktop and mobile starts to converge even more. We can start eliminating variables and have something that's much more cohesive. But if you wanted to make your own theme, you would just put in your own file theme dash your theme and then add whatever variables you want and it would compile it into your final CSS. This also I allowed for just static includes. So if you wanted to put in fonts or whatnot, you probably don't need any variables in that. You just slap it in there, and then it'll actually compile it in your final, just as is. So, it's themes. 
And what this allows you to do is you know, hone your craft. That was one of the comments we got when we were going out and talking to people about, you know, does this resonate with you? Would you use something like Topco? And it kept coming back to them wanting to actually use our tools more than our final output. And they wanted to actually see how we built it and then use those tools to build their own uh, version. I actually really like that idea. I like to be able to you know, expose all these tools and see what people do with them because they could probably do way more creative things than I would. So I can demo where we're at right now. Um, so I'm in the top code repo. I just pulled it down. You can download just from the website uh, a final built version and just use the CSS from there. But if you wanted to make your own build, this is what you do. It's just using Grunt. So I run Grunt. What it does is it's going out. It's getting the version of the tag version of the repo, pulling it down, the zip. And then it's going to open up the zip pull out all the style files, compile them all together based off of the you know, convention of configuration, and then make this final release CSS and copy over all the assets, the images, and the fonts. And what that gives you when you're all done is a style guide. So it'll generate the style guide. This is using style doco. So you can just copy and paste from here. This is a live working style guide. You can see the CSS that's, that's with it if you actually wanted to go and look at how we were doing stuff. Um, yeah, so this is what we have so far. And it, actually, it shows both of the variations, the dark and the light variations of the theme. So what if you just wanted you know, the header, you didn't care about our search inputs or whatnot. You could actually go through and make your another build. You could compose your own build. So I could go in through here and be like, well, I don't need that. I, don't want the, I only want navigation bar. So just run the build again once you have that in there. And this is the same thing with um, if you had a theme. If you like, made your own theme, you didn't want to pull ours down from Git, you could actually just drop it in, that, in the right folder, and it would run the build again and pull in your changes. So it built. I could probably just go back here and refresh. And see, all I have now is the header, right? So this way, you could customize your own builds. Mm, mm, one of those. OK. So we're really interested in contribution. That's why we're sharing it so early. I mean, we've only been working on this for three months. And you can see we only have a few of the components componentized. right? Uh, We'd like to see what people are interested in. And one of the best ways you could do that is actually file issues or make comments on stuff that we've already made. Because I like to think that it's open source, not open source. Like it actually is, one, want it to be community driven. We don't want to just be making something and bestowing it on the masses, right? We want people to actually say, this is what I want. Can you help me build it? Or this is what I want, and I've already built it. Here you go. So it actually grows that way. So we're, not, we're actually being useful. Um, all of this can be found on topcoat.io. It's all live can see all of our code and I'm damn and this is gish on twitter <laughs>